All right, let me get my screen share going. Does that work? Can everyone see it? All right. Um, well, thank you, Josh, as brown bag co-organizer, uh, for making me do this. Uh, as some of you may not know, at Berkeley, we don't have to defend our dissertations. Um, and so I see this as kind of a nice way to get um, maybe that feeling of closure that one would get from a defense. Um, I'd also like to thank Josh as a member of my committee. The other two members are my advisor, Jenna Johnson-Hanks, who um, unfortunately couldn't be here today, and Ann Swidler from sociology. Um, and I just want to say finishing a dissertation during lockdown <laughs> was really weird and hard. Um, and I really appreciate the support that my committee gave me. Um, I also want to say that uh, partly because I finished it during lockdown, I feel, as most people do, that um, this is sort of the beginning of a what I hope will be an ongoing work and um, not the end of the chapter of my life studying Russia. Um, so that's just to say I welcome uh, comments and criticisms of this work because I think that there's a lot more that I could do with it. All right. Oh, how do I do the next slide? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so I'm planning to talk today just about uh, one chapter of my dissertation, sort of the main one. Um, it is a qualitative chapter, which I know is a little uh, unusual for brown bag, but hopefully you'll enjoy it anyway. <laughs> um, and it's about uh, what I see as the role of culture in a broad sense uh, in explaining Russia's path through fertility postponement and lowest low fertility. Uh, I just wanted to start with a quick review on postponement, um, since not all of us are fertility people. Uh, so there's a large literature that examines the demographic and social aspects of postponement and lowest low fertility, which are phenomena that we've seen throughout most of the developed world in the last 30 years or so. Um, and so, of course, we have the, t the literature on tempo and quantum effects of uh, postponement as people delay childbearing. Um, which our own Josh Goldstein has contributed a great deal to. Um, literature that looks at lowest low as a transitory phenomenon, uh, lowest low fertility being a period TFR under 1.3 children per woman. Um, and that's something that we see in transition as societies are moving from an early to a late pattern of childbearing, right? Uh, and then there's also this large literature looking at the second demographic transition and ideational changes that change um, the pattern of childbearing and the quantum, the number of children people want to have. So Russia and Eastern Europe figure pretty prominently in this literature, um, especially in contrast to the Southern European pattern of lowest low fertility and postponement. Um, and in general, this literature finds that Eastern European postponement uh, happened because of the collapse of state socialism. That was sort of the impetus for these economic and social shocks that fundamentally changed the way that people bear children, right? Um, there's also some evidence for those ideational changes as um, economic futures have improved. You know, we're 30 years out from the collapse of state socialism now, so uh, quite a bit of that uh, has taken place as people, um, as the transition to the market economy has um, become more complete. Um, and so Sunny, who is here, has written about the post-communist fertility puzzle and separating out those two um, different uh, drivers of the shift in fertility. Um, and also Sergei Zakharov, uh, who is based in Moscow, um, argues for the second demographic transition in a negative light, saying that Russian fertility is really never going to recover. Um, and in general, in Russia, we see um, in the slides I'm about to show you a slow and mild postponement of first births, but uh, during the 90s and early 2000s, a very long delay or um, entire for foregoing of second and higher order births. Okay, so here, um, when I say bodily culture, these are some of the questions that I'm thinking of. Um, and the way I see it, the consideration of bodily culture has the potential to address um, several gaps in demographic theory making. Um, so first, we know empirically that postponement 
proceeds at different paces in different circumstances. And uh, we've put forth a lot of complex economic and social theories like the theory of the second demographic transition that I already mentioned um, that explain this. Um, and so those social theories incorporate pretty high level ideational changes, changes in ideals around marriage, beliefs about the importance of self-actualization and the role of entry into parenthood um, in the making of an adult person. But the body isn't really often um, explicitly included in those. Um, second, the historical literature and the literature on less developed societies often do, coming from an anthropological perspective, um, understand the calculus of reproduction as being deeply embodied. Um, but especially within demography, um, we often tend to rele relegate the calculus of childbearing to economic and rational thought in developed societies. Um, this echo echoes a general tendency in the field of demography to view pre-demographic transition societies as guided by tradition and the demographic transition as a rationalization of fertility. Um, and there's a large literature sort of criticizing that. Uh, and even in societies where the primacy of the economic and social decisions involved in childbearing is readily apparent, like Russia or the US, fertility planning still does require planning to grow a child inside a body even if sometimes it's someone else's body, if we're talking about assisted reproduction. And postponement thus implies postponing the decision to do that physical thing, right? Um, and so that's why I think that bodily culture is important. Uh, there is related literature on this. It's not you know, a total gap in the literature. Uh, namely, there's some research on social age limits to childbearing, um, this Balari paper, that I cite here um, finds that in Russia, it's the perceived social age limit for women is actually very similar to the rest of Europe. If you ask people when childbearing should stop, most people say 40 um, across Europe. There's also some literature on risk preferences and fertility choices. So women who are less risk averse tend to uh, be more willing to postpone childbearing. Um, and there's some new, really interesting uh, sociological work on egg freezing, looking at it as a manipulation of time and the life course, um, basically disentangling reproduction from romance. Um, there's also some Russia, some work about Russia that is related in important ways. Um, these three women are all anthropologists. Um, Cynthia Gabriel wrote her dissertation in 2003 about the idea, the notion of Russia as a dying nation and an unhealthy nation and how that impacted um, childbirth and childbearing practices. Um, Michelle Rifkin Fish has done a ton of work on women's health and um, engagement with the health system. And Ina Lakin is a little bit more tangentially related, but um, her dissertation, which she's turning into a book, is about um, the Russian discourse around demographic crisis, and it's super interesting. Um, nonetheless, uh, a lot of this literature still focuses very much on um, aging and time in a very linear and limited way. And so I think that um, bodily culture can, can add to this literature. Okay, so, um, a quick, oh, I should probably have a clock up somewhere, huh? Okay, I'm doing okay. <laughs> um, sort of a quick dive into what Russia's postponement transition actually looked like. Here we see the total fertility rate in Russia. Um, this is unadjusted uh, from 1989 to 2018. I've got a dotted line here on um, 1.3, which is lowest low fertility. So we can see that um, fertility started falling actually a bit before this in 1987 and um, went under lowest low fertility for about 10 years uh, after the collapse of state socialism until it really started to recover around 2006. Um, it's fallen a lot again in the last couple of years um, and this is, I'm not going to talk about this part of my dissertation, but I um, make use of regional variation to show that this is pure pro-cyclical. Um, the Russian economy had a huge contraction in 2014 to 2016 um, because of the sanctions after they seized Ukraine, uh, Crimea, right? And so um, this really seems like it's a big pro-cyclical thing that the economy contracted and we're seeing a fertility contraction because of that. 
but you know they're still doing pretty okay. They got up to 1.75, very similar to the U.S., um, and now they're getting back down, sort of towards 1.5 children per woman. Um, here I show the pace of postponement. You know, I really should have made it so that the solid red line was Russia. I feel like that would have been uh, the obvious choice, but that's actually Denmark. Um, just showing that, uh, like the other post-socialist countries where postponement began in the 1990s, um, the mean age at first birth and the variance in the age at first birth were really low when the post postponement transition started, and postponement itself has proceeded pretty slowly. Uh, in Russia, not as slowly as the US and Canada, but uniformly more slowly than in European countries. Um, and just a note on reading this, uh, year zero is the first year um, of the first five year period in which the mean age at first birth rose every year. So year zero is a different year for all of these countries, right? And for Russia, I believe it's 1994. Yeah, 1994. Um, so here is just a picture of the mean age at first birth. Um, I had to combine two data sources to do this because HFD starts earlier and the Russian fertility and mortality database goes later um, just to get the really big picture. Um, but as we can see, the, the pace of postponement is kind of slow. Um, Postponement didn't start right away when fertility fell. So fertility was falling right here. Um, but still in those early years of collapse, you still had a lot of 20 and 21 year olds having um, kids. And then uh, it, the rise started in 1994 and the mean age at first birth didn't reach the age of 25 until um, 2013. Um, although it was a slow transition, I wanted to put this graph in just to show um, how much the variance in age at first birth changed. So this is a density plot. So the area under each one is one. Um, it shows percentage of first births. So in 1984, 14% of first births were occurring at age 20. Um, and then by 2018, the peak age for first birth was 24, and that only accounted for 8%. So a very, very big change in uh, the, the spread, the variance of when people are having that first child, right? Um, so we can see this, this postponement transition as slow um, and mild to some degree, but still it represents a really fundamental change in the way that Russian women are having kids. Um, okay, I want to close this sort of quantitative part by saying that it's important not to see Russia as a total anom anomaly or as, you know, an absolutely canonical case, but just to think about what makes it different from other places um, and how the specifics of bodily culture could relate to that. Um, I guess I will pause, right, are there any questions? Yes, we have a couple of questions so far, both from, uh, well, Josh, I think is noting in this figure here that in 2015, it looks like there's a kind of bimodality. I can't see which color is 2015. Um, is that, is that related to its social inequality and the diffusion of this behavior? That's a great question. Um, and on brand for Josh, since that's something that he works on. <laughs> for the US, um, but I think so. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my sample um, who are educated women from a small town um, and they definitely see themselves as being one of the modes in this kind of bimodal population. They talk about, um, so the town that I was in is really close to Rostov, which is one of Russia's biggest cities. Um, and they talk about how different women in Rostov are and how uh, much later they postpone childbearing. So I don't actually, I have anecdotal evidence for that basically, um, but I think that that's probably worth pursuing. Great, okay. We, we also have one more question from Josh uh, that I came up a little bit earlier. Um, so first, is it right that the survey evidence from Bellare and colleagues shows that Russia is uh, similar to other European countries, kind of in contrast to what you're finding from your qualitative evidence? And if so, do you have any theories for why that might be? 
Yeah, um, I am going to talk about that. It's, um, I would argue that asking people a numerate age deadline for childbearing is just not a very good instrument um, for how people think about childbearing. Great. Okay. Um, and with that, I will continue. Okay. Keep, okay. Um, so my qualitative research was field work in fall 2017 um, in this small-ish town called Tuck and Roke, um, which is down here. So it's right by the border actually with the contested area of Ukraine, um, which was interesting, although not in, in fall 2017, it wasn't particularly tense. A lot of people had a lot of opinions about Ukraine, um, but you know, there weren't tanks rolling down the street or anything. Um, this field work was supported by the US Department of State. Thank you, taxpayers. Um, and so I spent a semester there and I interviewed 41 women of childbearing age, ranging from 20 to 45. Um, it was, it was a nice size sample. Um, I really tried while I was there and completely failed to interview women with less education. Um, but, uh, it was really hard to do that. Russian society, much like the U S is, um, pretty class striated. And a lot of my contacts didn't have any contacts who hadn't gone to college, um, or gotten a middle professional education. That's a Russian term. It's kind of like um, a trade school, basically. Uh, so that's definitely a limitation of this sample. It's very much, uh, my findings are about educated women from a small city. Taganrog is about um, 240,000 people, which for Russia is like mid small. Um, and I chose Tug and Rogue because I had been there before, basically. I did a Fulbright there in 2008 teaching English, so I already had um, good connections there. And I'm really glad I did that because it was a very short field trip. Um, and I really relied on some of those connections to get me my first interviews, um, which I then, you know, I used snowball sampling and um, it worked great, but I don't think I would have been able to interview 41 people if I had gone, for example, to Moscow. Um, and just been approaching strangers. Um, so my interviews were uh, semi-structured, semi um, recorded in Russian and then transcribed and translated by me. Um, I also, oh yeah, I didn't put this on the slide, but I also collected some ethnographic data. Um, I happened to be pregnant myself when I was there. Um, which was very handy for experiencing the Russian medical system. And I participated in a, a prenatal yoga class and things like that. OK, um, so I'm about to hit you with a lot of slides with quotations on them. Um, and to avoid getting lost, I wanted to go over the structure of the rest of the talk. Um, so I divided my findings into um, three main groups. First, I'm going to talk about how women talked about aging um, as depletion of good health, uh, as a relationship to the medical system, and then a little bit on parity specific views on age. Um, I think we're all demographers, but in case we're not, um, parity means how many kids you have. So parity one is your first birth, parity two is your second, um, et cetera. Uh, then I'm going to talk about bodily equilibrium. Um, divided into temperature and um, hormonal equilibrium, which was a really important part of this, uh, my findings. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about notions of fragility and how the medical system treats uh, pregnant women. Okay. So at the center of bodily culture's relationship to fertility postponement um, is the body's frailty and susceptibility to injury. Putting off fertility logically is riskier for bodies that are perceived to be easily injured or unable to fully recover from injury. Um, so in terms familiar to demographers, we might imagine that different bodily cultures uh, are envisioning different hazard rates and different su survivorship curves, where the survivors at each age are the share of people who, for whom it is still appropriate to try to have a kid, right? Um, I think that this is a more numerate and um, more, much more clear-cut idea of aging and frailty than people actually have in their heads, but I think for demographers it's a good illustration. Um, 
because we can imagine that a bodily culture that assumes hardiness uh, is represented by a high and flat survivorship curve. So aging doesn't matter so much for childbearing in a culture like that. Well, while one that assumes frailty has a steeper one and um, having kids earlier is a little bit higher stakes in a culture like that, right? Um, and so here are a few quotes about how Russians think about aging and frailty. So Antonina, who was 44 um, and had had two kids in her 20s, um, highlighted that everybody understands that ages 20 to 28 are the best times to have kids. Um, but people w delay the process because of various reasons. Relevantly, her son was 24 and like not even close to getting married. So she was sort of like explaining how, why um, her, her own child was in this optimal age, but um, not really planning to have kids anytime soon. He was off in Moscow um, trying to break into the movie industry. So, um, she says, even based on myself, I can say that the first child was much easier and probably his health was stronger because my body was newer. Um, I really liked that my body was newer phrase, um, sort of a metaphor of maybe machinery or something. And the second time she says, yes, there were already some complications, even though she was still um, 28 years old when, when she had that second kid. Um, so this was very common among older women who had had their births in their 20s, but younger women also agreed um, about the optimal age. So Tamara, who's 23 and not married and doesn't have any kids yet, um, says that the optimal age is up to age 25 um, because while the body is young, it's just the time to give birth. Um, so she imagines that as you age, you have a ton of work and um, carrying someone inside you is a stress on your body, right? Um, she had recently watched a YouTube video about um, Russian health and had learned about, you know, societies where people, where the life expectancy is around 90, uh, like Japan or something. Um, and so she says, okay, you know, maybe in those countries it makes sense, but Russians, uh, you know, our health is kind of a mess. Um, Nadia, though, presented a conflicting view. Um, so she's 40 and she had two kids uh, at around like 24 and 32. Um, and she says, well, before, if a woman was near 40, she was already totally middle-aged. Um, but now things have gotten better. Um, and women not only look better, but they can exercise more. And uh, some tasks that robbed them of time and energy have been taken over by technology, she says. Um, so she says, now it's normal for people to become moms, especially for the second or third time. So there's a bit of that parody bit, right? Um, from age 30 to 40, or even a bit after 40, but only a bit. So here we can already see um, with both Nadia and Antonina some hedging about exactly when it's okay to have the kid. Um, so there's this idea that people acknowledge that there is some kind of age limit, but um, it's a little bit squishy, right? This continues um, with these two quotes, uh, which contrast uh, physically optimal early motherhood with conscious motherhood. So Olya, uh, who had kids at 22 and 28, she had a newborn when I talked to her, um, said that closer to 30, you already have a completely different understanding of children, implying that it's, it's better for the child to have an older mother, right? Um, and Renata, who was 43 and had one birth at age 24, um, characterize births after 30 as being at a grown-up age, um, or a mature age, I guess. Um, I guess Russian doesn't really have a difference between those two words. Grown-up sounds a little bit immature, but anyway. Um, she, yeah, so she, she sees, um, a contrast between, uh, the early birth that she had in the 1990s, and she's a college teacher, so she has, She's teaching uh, mostly girls because she teaches English um, and all the English majors are women. Um, and she sees them waiting much longer to have children. Okay, so um, the medical system is a, a huge site of uh, discourse about aging and birth in Russia. Um, and 
one reason for that is that Russian has a term, Yashaya. I'm sorry, I didn't translate it, but it's, it's a little bit untranslatable. Um, it's kind of equivalent to uh, geriatric pregnancy or advanced maternal age, um, but it little, literally means old birthing. So it's an adjective that describes the woman, um, a, an old birther. Um, and so Angelica, who's 28 and had just had a child, um, says that it's for everyone who's over 25, probably, for women who give birth later. Um, but she says that she hasn't really experienced this and then notes that when she went to the doctor when she was younger, they said that she needed to have kids sooner rather than later or her processes would wilt. Um, so here we have sort of an organic metaphor of the body rather than mechanical about the body being newer, but um, here about uh, biology wilting away. So she says, even the doctors were saying that to me when she was 23, but then later when she was actually pregnant and experiencing the medical system, she didn't hear anything like that. Um, and this was a common refrain about Stararad Yasha, that um, people weren't really sure when it was supposed to start, um, you know, what the medical definition of it was um, and who it should be applied to. Um, Galena, who's 39 and has three children, uh, echoed Angelica's uh, idea of Stararodyashaya as well, saying that um, when she was 13 or 19 rather and had her first kid, it was considered super, um, that that was a really healthy age to have kids. And then she said when she had her third at 37, nobody called her Stararodyashaya. Um, and now it's the other way around. Doctors try to push births further along because the body must mature and strength strengthen. Uh, so she is sort of mirroring Angelica's metaphor of wilting, saying that even medically now they consider that an older body maybe is a stronger body. And this um, metaphor of decay doesn't apply anymore. Um, this also sort of dovetails nicely with what um, the previous co quotes were saying about conscious motherhood, right? Not only are you more conscious and more able to uh, care for your kids when you're older, but also maybe your body is more mature and stronger. Um, so the next three slides uh, illustrate the idea of Stadarad Yashaya as kind of a punitive concept. Um, so we had the two, previous two people saying that it wasn't applied to them, right? Um, well, in this forum post, there's this 38-year-old um, expressing outrage that uh, her coworker had recently gone in for a prenatal ap appointment and been declared Stararad Yashaya, even though she was only 29 and it was her second birth. Um, and so she says, what about me? My first birth was at 35 and my second was at 38. And no one, not one doctor, told me that I was Stararad Yashaya to say nothing about, of writing it on my medical card, which is this card that you carry with you to medical appointments. Um, it, it's, it's basically your chart, right? Um, so here, she, you know, she's outraged at the idea that this woman would be labeled this way and thinks it's unfair. Um, Yelena, who is 41 and had her kids, um, one in her early 20s and one in her early 30s, I asked her if she had ever encountered this term and she said no and the reason that she gave is that the doctor knows her. Um, the doctor knew her and knew that she was planning to have two kids. And so um, because she understood that and knew that she was going to get around to it, she didn't uh, punish her or pressure her in this way by referring to her as, as an old birther. So here we see Yelena didn't meet this punishment, um, but she still sort of views it that way, right? This was also the case with Xenia, who is 42. Um, and struggled for a long time to get pregnant. She finally was diagnosed with endometriosis and treated and then was able to have two children in her 30s. Um, and she also says that um, she wasn't treated badly by the gynecologists uh, because they knew her. She'd been going to appointments for years trying to get her problems fixed. Um, and they all knew that if she lost the, her child, it would be a huge tragedy, um, that he had come at a great cost. And so she frames Stararad Yashaya as uh, critical treatment and says that she avoided it by having these good relationships, right? Um, although most of my inter interlocutors rejected this idea of Stararad Yashaya, it still retains political relevance in Russia um, and it's deeply connection, connected to Russia's idea of its demographic crisis. Um, so this is a quote 
from 2019, actually, um, from Gennady Anishenko, who is a, he used to be basically the Minister of Health, um, and now he is a, a member of parliament of the Duma. Um, and so the Russian State Statistics Service um, announced in 2019 that the average, uh, the mean age at first birth had risen to 26. And he came out saying, um, there's a term for this, there are yashaya, um, and it's a serious and disheartening problem for us. A second or third birth at age 26 is fine because that is peak reproductive age. But if at age 26 a woman is giving birth to only her first child, then that's not very good either for her or for her child. So here we have this idea that um, parity is relevant in considering aging and um, specific ages are appropriate for births of specific parities, right? Um, I also had a couple of interviewees who shared this opinion. Um, this is Vasilisa, who is um, a school nurse. And so she, she actually, she gave me a lot of really good quotes because she has medical training and a lot of like very strong opinions about medicine. Um, and she says, after 30, they send everyone for a cesarean, which is actually not true. Um, but uh, without consideration, that is everyone who's giving birth for the first time. I think that all the same, it must be harder to carry the child uh, if you're pregnant for the first time after you're 30, because your health isn't what it used to be. Um, so here we, we see again that there's this idea that um, if your body has been tested already and you've already had a kid, then it's appropriate to have another one after 30. But if you're doing it for the first time, um, you're a little old and it might be kind of hard. Okay, um, having gotten through the aging stuff, I wanna pause and see if there are any more questions before we start this sort of big hormone chunk. How are we on time? Uh, I think we have, uh, say, 10 more minutes for the talk and then some questions at the end, if that sounds good to you. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but I had, I had a question about how the extent to which you expect these um, cultural views of the body to be like a national phenomenon, or do you think that that's something that will vary regionally and sort of in parallel the trends in fertility that you're describing at the national level? Is that something that we pretty much see the same pattern repeated subnationally or is that, would you expect there to be variation in different parts of the country? Um, I would expect there to be variation certainly by um, size of city. I think that in the really big cities like Moscow and Rostov, um, well, I don't think, I know, <laughs> uh, that the mean age at first birth is higher and family size is smaller. Um, in terms of sort of broader regional variation, Russia is surprisingly homogenous for how big it is um, in terms of sort of like the, um, for example, the, the economic indicators between regions, um, partly just because it's, it's not quite like the US where states have a lot of independence, right? Um, there, is a, there is cultural variation, um, for example, in the North Caucasus, uh, it's the, the republics there are heavily Muslim. Um, and heavily rural, and fertility there is definitely much higher than in the sort of central, uh, predominantly ethnically Russian republics. But overall, um, it's there's definitely an urban-rural divide and a big city-small city divide, but not as much of a geographic gradient as you might expect. Any other questions for Leslie now? I could ask a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me turn my video on here. I, I was just thinking about what you said related to um, Josh's question about how uh, Billary's findings would make us think that there are these differences in age norms. And um, I suspect that you're right, that asking people to just give a number isn't the best way of picking this up. But I just wanted to say that I think that it's it wasn't the best question used in the Billary study because they used the ESS data, which asks, if I remember correctly, it asks about the limit to childbearing. Mm -hmm. But I think the GGS asks about age norms for entering parenthood. And um, the reason I was remembering this is because I, I did a, a study on Estonia and we separated the Russian origin from the Estonian origin individuals. And there was a substantial gap between what they thought was the best time to enter 
parenthood, which is interesting in relation to Dennis's question just now too, because I mean, this basically is saying that even outside of Russia, Russians still carry this sort of um, bodily culture with them. And it's very distinct from what we saw with the Estonians in terms of age norms. Um, I always thought that was fascinating. It would have been so super interesting to go do some interviews with the doctors if women are seeing different doctors there, where they're getting this because it was a five year gap, if I remember correctly. There's an Estonian paper that's written that, um, that talks about that age gap that I can send you a reference for if you're interested. I'm definitely interested, thank you. Um, yeah, I really wish that there were more waves of the GGS available for Russia um, because it has such great questions. Um, yeah, thank you. Great, all right, thanks. Well, so I, you know, uh, five, 10 minutes to, to, um, to finish up. Thanks, Leslie, and then we'll take some more questions. Okay. Sound good? Okay, okay. I, have, I have so many quotes on Hormones. I'm going to try to get through them fast. Okay, um, so bodily equilibrium. Um, in addition to aging, notions of bodily balance were really important to the bodily culture that I observed, experienced, and discussed with my interviewees. Um, so this is Vasilisa again, the school nurse, talking about her experience in Stavropol. Um, I asked her, she said that a lot of Russians are struggling with infertility now, and I asked her why, and this was her answer. Um, she appealed to a higher medical authority, um, saying that the head of the Department of Gynecology in Stavropol, which is another southern Russian city, um, says, these girls, are they all walk by, it's winter, it's cold, they're in short skirts, um, they're freezing, and there are inflammatory processes that happen that affect their health. Um, so this is a really old tradition in Russia, um, and it's not unique to Russia. The concept of disease as originating in deviations from bodily balance is central to um, many health belief systems, including the ancient Greek humoral medicine, which is where this comes from and where a lot of European bodily culture comes from, um, but also Ayurvedic medicine and traditional Chinese medicine. Um, and the substance, substances or measures that should be kept in equilibrium vary. Um, they may be the humors or the classical elements or concepts such as wet and dry and hot and cold. Um, and the relative importance of these substances can evolve over time. Um, so Greek humoral medicine is much more complex than just staying out of the cold. Um, but in Russia, um, for at least the last century, it seems like heat and cold are sort of the primary focus of that. Um, there's a, a Russian folk tradition called tempering or the Kalavanya, um, which involves exposing yourself to cold water. You might've seen like um, photos of Russian polar bear swimmers diving into like ice filled lakes. Um, and the idea is that this gets, gets your body used to variations from equilibrium. Um, and the, the early Soviets encouraged this as a healthful practice. And a lot of, especially older people still do it today. Um, so the maintenance of steady body temperature is pretty important. Um, Vasilisa was the only interviewee who talked about it. Um, and I guess I won't talk about this because I don't have a ton of time, but I had a lot of personal experience with it. Um, as a foreigner who was pregnant, uh, just not knowing like what I was supposed to do and what was okay to do and not do. So for, for example, in my prenatal yoga class, it was okay uh, to go barefoot in the classroom because the floor was heated, um, but I walked across the hall barefoot to the changing room and I got yelled at um, because that was too cold. Um, so it was something that I experienced a lot, even though my interviewees, you know, it was such a quotidian part of their lives. They didn't really talk about it. But um, hormones and their role in the body's equilibrium uh, came up a lot because we were talking about pregnancy and contraception and childbearing, right? Um, and so here's two subjects. I won't read out the quotes, um, but both of them were prescribed progesterone early in their pregnancies um, for reasons that they viewed as uh, kind of unimportant. Progesterone is used in early pregnancy. It's used here too. Um, because it uh, keeps the uterine lining healthy. Um, and so if you've had recurrent miscarriages, it's something that you might be put on. Um, and there's actually, there's not a lot of risk in being put on it, even if you don't need it. Um, there are like some side effects, but it's, it's something your body is making anyway in early pregnancy. So um, it's not that surprising that they were pro uh, provided it prophylactically, right? 
Um, and Kira took it, but Liliana did some research and said, you know, if my body is ready, I don't want to ruin my body with hormones. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna eat healthy and hope for the best. She was pregnant. She was from my yoga class. She was pregnant when we talked. Um, so after this, I sort of investigated online um, on the local parenting board and found several posts about being provide, uh, prescribed the stuff called Dufastone, which is uh, progesterone. Um, and these examples that women gave for why they were prescribed it and um, their concerns about whether it was okay to take. So this, this woman um, was prescribed it because she's 34 and she had a C-section. Um, which in the US would not be an indication for it. Um, of course, she could also have misunderstood, right? And the response was that doctors love to prescribe it without having checked your progesterone, go submit a blood sample, and you can figure out for yourself whether you need to take it. Um, this is an interesting note because laboratories, so Russia has a national health system, right? Um, laboratories are often privately run though, and you can kind of, um, if you have the money for it, you know, it's not terribly expensive, but if you have the money, you can just sort of like take some blood and fill out a form and say, hey, test me for this. Um, so in that sense, it sort of, um, it gives women a sense of body expertise and um, elides the different, the distinction between doctor and patient, right? So um, I saw a lot on these forums, uh, advice about how to diagnose and treat yourself by looking at your labs. Uh, here's Vasilisa again, talking not about pregnancy, but about um, emergency contraception. Um, and so she had a girl come to her and say that she felt really bad physically because she had taken emergency contraception. Um, and Vasilisa characterizes this as an explosion of hormones um, that could destroy what she calls your hormonal baseline. Um, and that she sees as something that could have lasting effects. Uh, and she compares it to uh, the long-standing Russian tradition of not aborting a first pregnancy. Um, just because depending on the specialist, if he does it wrong, you could ruin that hormonal baseline and not be able to have children later. Um, and so Vasilis's use of the terms explosion of hormones and hormonal baseline reflect um, more general hormonal metaphors that I encountered, emphasizing equilibrium and violent disruption of it. Um, this was also the case a lot for women who talked about their use of contraception. Um, in the interest of time, I won't read these, but um, both of these women had used hormonal contraceptives and stopped because of concerns about disrupting their horm hormonal baseline, right? Um, and Marina said that um, when you get off of the pills, that which was held back before, like acne or um, your hair being greasy, appears with double force which I thought was a very um, sort of humoral medicine kind of metaphor. Leslie, Even do you think we're, sorry, to, do you think we're getting close to, in a couple minutes, it would be, we could start taking some questions, does that sound? Yes, I'm on slide 27 okay. of 32, is that okay? Excellent, wonderful, okay. thank you. Um, even those who like contraceptives, um, exhibited sort of mistrust of them. Um, this is Olia who was 28 and um, expressed frustration that, you know, she'd taken contraceptives. She wasn't that worried about them, although she does like to take breaks from them. Um, but she was frustrated that uh, the gynecologist doesn't analyze you in any way in order to decide which kind would be good for you. Um, and she was very disappointed to hear that it's actually the same way in the US. You just have to try different ones and you know, if they make you depressed, you have to switch. Um, and she thought that that wasn't fair and that, um, they're, they're so risky that there should be a better way to, to figure out how to find ones that work for you. Um, Sasha also um, is on hormonal contraceptives and is happy with them, but had um, some very strict ideas about what one can and can't do on them. Um, so she said that she can't drink beer because beer itself is a strong hormone. Um, this is, it's technically true, hops, um, are a source of phytoestrogens, um, but generally aren't contraindicated actually. And she says that you have to be careful with how much water you drink because your kidneys are working really hard with these hormones. So just in general, there was this sense, right, that um, hormones are, are something that you should handle with care. Um, and 
the metaphor of equilibrium was clearly important, but it seems to lead to different effects in the cases of temperature and hormones, since temperature can be directly observed um, and disbalances in thermal regulation can be easily corrected, right? Whereas with hormones, the belief in an important and fragile equilibrium lends itself to um, mistrust of intrusion into the body's homeostasis, especially among those who believe that um, this internal equilibrium can be permanently disrupted. This has implications for women's willingness to accept hormonal treatments during pregnancy and also for uh, public opinion on the safety of contraceptives. Russia is a society um, where women rate their contraceptive knowledge pretty low. Um, and uh, a lot of women prefer not to use the pill. Okay, finally and super quickly, um, fragility in medicine. Um, the the perception that doctors prescribe unnecessary hormonal treatments during pregnancy aligns with a broader claim about Russian public health um, that's often encountered in research from outside, which is that um, it tends to overdiagnose and overtreat and prioritize narrowly trained specialists over general practitioners and um, rely on hospitalization a lot, um, even for minor conditions. Um, determining the necessity of treatment is definitely outside the scope of this project, but I did see a lot of women talking about, um, especially about C-section for birth. Um, so Olia here is complaining because she's a very small person and they wanted to do a C-section um, when she went to the doctor in Taganrog. She ended up going to Rostov to give birth because she didn't want a C-section. Um, and then several uh, people talked about having C-sections just because their baby was large. Um, so Angelica, um, they measured the fetus and they said, oh, he's really big and he needs to come out right away. And she had a C-section immediately the next day. She wasn't sad about this or anything, but um, she was like, no, it was definitely um, because of his size immediately to the C-section. And Anastasia wanted a C-section, um, but didn't get one and said that in Rostov, if you go there, if it's more than four kilograms, then they do it automatically and it's great. Um, not related to C-section, Galena, again, who had three kids, talking about how the doctor said that she shouldn't have any more kids because her body is worn out, um, that uh, basically it's too much stress and she should be done. So women's perceptions of the relationship between fragility and the medical system are diverse. Um, not everyone really saw it as a bad thing. Um, and these discourses seem to carry a tension between fragility caused by lack of medical care um, in the instance of not getting a C-section that you wanted and that caused by medical malice or negligence, right? Um, although the origins of distrust in the medical system differ between the US and Russia, I don't have time to talk about that, but it's very interesting. Um, there's, uh, this is definitely part of a broader trend. The movement towards vaccine refusal has grown in tandem in both places, for example. Um, and there's also in Russia now, also a movement towards home birth and doula-led birth that's sort of just starting out. All right, we made it. These are my conclusions. Um, so with aging, we see flexible understandings of age and frailty um, indicating that pure ideas of aging probably don't do that much to um, slow down postponement, right? Because people have different ways about, of thinking about motherhood at different ages and this trade-off between physically and emotionally op optimal motherhood. Um, hormones seem like they might have a much larger influence, um, both because of mistrust of medical practice and pervasive belief in contraceptives as risky, uh, especially with the, the norm of not aborting a first pregnancy. Um, if people don't want to use contraceptives, then you end up obviously with uh, more accidental first babies at younger ages, right? And finally, fragility, um, I found a continued medical perspective of pregnant women as fragile and in need of intervention um, and mixed reactions to this from women themselves. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Leslie, for a fascinating talk. Um, so for those who are interested in sticking, we're, we're right at one o'clock, but if you're interested in sticking around to discuss this a little bit longer, we'll go till 1.10 as we usually do. Um, we can start off with the questions. We have one from Robert Pickett, who is um, asking if there's a logic to the fact that the polar bear swimmers uh, immerse themselves in frigid water to help uh, fortify themselves against these fluctuations in temperature, while um, young women wearing short skirts are inviting unhealthy inflammatory processes. What's the, what, do you have any speculation about what the reasoning is 
Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, obviously part of it is just misogyny, right? Um, But also there's um, a, there's like a very specific, like um, Zakalavania, this this idea of inoculating yourself, you have to follow very specific rules. Um, So you have to start with just like a little bit of cold shower every day um, or wiping yourself down with a cold washcloth. And you really, you have to build up to being a, a polar bear swimmer. Um, and so I guess there's probably an assumption that young women are not doing that in, in wearing these short skirts in winter. Great. Uh, we have another question from Ken. Um, what's the proportion of women doctors among Russian OBGYNs, at least uh, around Rostov? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, in general, medicine is a feminized pro- uh, profession in Russia because doctors aren't paid very well. Um, and I don't know the exact proportion. Most of my interviewees reported seeing um, women doctors and midwives. Um, I I saw a private doctor because I didn't have access to the state medical system, and he was a guy. But um, yeah, a lot of most of them saw women, and actually a lot of them had opinions about whether they preferred to deliver with a man or a woman. Um, many of them preferred to deliver with a man, um, with the logic being that they feel sorry for you um, they, because they, they never have to experience this pain. And so they're more likely to feel sorry for your suffering rather than telling you to tough it out. So feel free. So if you have a question, you can also put your name in the chat and I'll, I'll hand the the mic over to you and you can ask your your question directly. Um, Stephanie Bonds is is wondering, do you think individuals in this context are similarly distrustful of non-hormonal contraceptives? No. Um, I, so I found that there was um, not a very high level of knowledge about IUDs um, and the difference between hormonal and non-hormonal IUDs. But uh, other research shows that a lot of Russians use condoms. um, And the only complaint with that, you know, the usual complaints with condoms, it doesn't feel good. And they're also pretty expensive in Russia. Um, A lot of my interviewees who were willing to talk about it actually said that they use the pull-out method still, um, which is um, probably a higher proportion of these women in a small town use the pull-out method than in Russia as a whole, but it is more common there than in other places. Um, But yeah. I'm wondering, have you investigated um, the content of medical training in Russia at all? And how, how does that line up with the cultural views you've described here? I've started a little bit. Um, I that I definitely want sort of an analysis of the sort of the material conditions of medicine in Russia to be the next step in this project. Um, and there's um, there's a lot of criticism of Russian medis- uh, medical education um, because a lot of the good medical education literature is in English and Russia has a pretty low level of English knowledge. Um, There's also, there tends to also be a criticism that a lot of the people working today were trained um, in the Soviet Union. Uh, That's, we're finally getting to the point where most of them are retiring, but um, I would imagine that training for new doctors is different. Um, There there was also, I didn't get to talk about it here, but um, I encountered in my questions about cesarean sections, uh, a belief that if you have bad eyesight, you have to have a cesarean uh, because the pushing uh, during childbirth can tear your retina. Uh, I found that super interesting and I researched it and it turns out that actually everybody believed this in like the 60s. Uh, And then more research was done in Western Europe and it was found that it's not true. Um, But basically that research never reached the Soviet Union. Um, because of the international public health dynamics at the time. Um, Although the Soviet Union did have good connections with some uh, Western European countries in in exchange of medicine. Anyway, I'm rambling. Um, But yeah, so there's a lot of outdated stuff um, that still happens in medical training. Hmm. Great. Um, 
we have a big picture question from Josh. Um, do you have any thoughts on the origins of bodily culture? Is this something that's mostly Soviet or is this Russian over the centuries? And, and what does that mean for the speed of future change? Uh, in other words, the, pa the pace of postponement. That's a good question. Um, I think that big picture, what matters more for the pace of postponement is not necessarily the origin of this bodily culture, but um, how quickly it seems to be changing um, with basically with internet access. Um, I, you know, when I went to Takanaga in 2008, it was still not super common to have the internet at home um, and you had to buy like these dial-up cards and it was a whole thing. Um, but now uh, it's sort of every aspect of life in Taganrog really seemed uh, to have been touched by sort of the broader global internet culture. So like there was a coffee shop that had macarons, um, which I couldn't imagine in 2008, but like these sort of global food trends like that um, spread very quickly. Uh, and I saw the same thing with, for example, um, this doula-led birth movement. I follow a doula from Rostov on Instagram. Um, and the stuff she posts is like basically the exact same stuff that an American doula would post. Um, and I'm really interested in sort of the knowledge sharing there. Um, but basically, yeah, so I think that um, this notion of temperature equilibrium is fading a little bit with the, the older generation. And it's sort of an open question how uh, how much that transfer over to the idea of hormonal equilibrium will stay um, as kind of a local culture. And a sort of a follow up from Josh. Uh, he, he, once fertility moves to being later, are there aspects of bodily culture that you expect will be drawn on to rationalize that or explain that as being healthy? Or does bodily culture sort of deterministically mean that that older childbirth is unhealthy. Right, I think it, it's absolutely not deterministic. Um, and I think the most important part there was um, the way that people talked about aging and conscious motherhood um, and, or as I think Galena said, um, becoming stronger as you age and the body maturing. So I think that uh, there's nothing necessarily deterministic about this idea of the body aging rapidly and uh, becoming frail rapidly. Uh, and I think that the power of that narrative is really tied to Russia's demographic crisis and this belief that Russians are really unhealthy um, and dying young. They are kind of unhealthy and dying young, although it's really not as bad as it used to be. Um, and so I think that as uh, the population health status kind of changes, I can totally see um, that narrative of aging changing as well. Great, do we have one last question from anyone? We have a couple of minutes. Okay. Could I ask a question? Um, <clears throat> thank you for a really, really interesting presentation. I'm wondering, what, what is your intuition? Uh, would conceptions of bodily culture differ if your sample was less educated? Intuitively, I want to say yes. Um, and I almost feel completely uh, unqualified to remark on that. Um, but yeah, I feel like, um, especially with the notion of hormonal balance and um, taking care of your hormones and going to the lab and getting analyses on your own, um, that's a very like biopolitics, biopower kind of, of way of thinking about your body, right? Um, of managing your body and con controlling your health. Um, and I think that some of that certainly comes from uh, being middle class and highly educated. Um, yeah, and I'd love to, to talk to those women with less education um, and find out about that. Also, as a corollary to that, did you have any sense from your uh, respondents um, as to how their housing situation affected their fertility choices? 
Yes. Oh, I could talk so much about that. Um, so a big part of Russia's um, pronatalist program in the last 10 years has been this maternity capital policy, where if you have a second or higher order birth, you can get this lump sum payment. Um, it's limited use, but one of the things you can use it for is housing. And especially in Tug and Road, where um, land is pretty plentiful and it's the cost of living is not high, a lot of my um, interviewees who had second children talked about how important that was to being able to have that second kid. Um, because a lot of people are in this pretty old Soviet housing stock, right? Um, very small apartments, completely normal to have one bedroom and have the kids in the bedroom and mom and dad sleep in the living room. Um, but as standards of living have risen, people don't really want to do that anymore, right? Um, and so a lot of people, yeah, talk about how important it is to, to be able to have an apartment. Some, um, especially the, the wealthier ones, also talked about a new norm of really wanting to be able to provide an apartment for each of your children, um, which I think is, is possible in Taganrog because of the price of real estate and, and whatnot. But um, definitely influence some people's fertility decisions. You, you, you don't want to have three kids if you can't buy three apartments to leave for them. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie, for a wonderful talk. Let's all um, unmute our microphones and clap so Leslie can hear our, our, our congratulations. And if, if you are um, interested in joining us for this experiment uh, with this um, social interaction platform, I'm going to paste the link in the chat for this Zoom call, and I'll keep this Zoom call open for a bit longer. So um, click on this link. It should be uh, pretty self-explanatory.